Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us again today on one of our Pay360 webinars. Um, today's session is around PCI DSS. Uh, I can see there's quite a lot of you joined in today, so hopefully it's going to be one that's of interest to you all. Um, you may know who I am. I'm James Pickering. I have been on a number of these webinars now since the beginning of the year. I'm having uh, a pretend holiday today because the sun's shining, so I've put my jazzy shirt on. I'm going to try and enjoy the last little bit of sunshine that we might get this year. Uh, I've got to slip that in before Wayne managed to chuck in that uh, I was wearing a daft shirt or something. So as I've alluded to, Wayne is going to be um, covering off most of the content today. We've also got John Greenwood with us who wanted to be with us on camera on the session, but through a number of um, different technology issues he's had this morning, he's had to dial in, unfortunately. So you should hopefully be able to hear him. Um, you are probably aware this is one of many webinars we've been running this year. So obviously since March time, we've all um, kind of been working from home rather than out on site with you guys. Um, we ran a whole host of events earlier in the year and based on the good feedback that we had, um, we were asked to run some more. So we've put together a schedule of events. We're probably about halfway through now. Um, I've got some notes just here. We, we've run some sessions around um, debt recovery and remote contact center working. Um, knowing your customer, cash collection. Um, this is today's session on PCI DSS. We've got some anti-money laundering sessions. We've got um, a whole host of different things, including integration and, and product updates and stuff like that. Um, if you are interested in any of the other sessions we're running, if you didn't know we were running any other sessions, it would be really great to hear from you. Um, we'll leave our contact details in the Q&A box that you should see pop up. On Q&A, if you haven't been on one of these sessions before, if you give your mouse a wiggle on the screen, you should see a little bar pops up in the middle there. One of those options is Q&A. Uh, that's the way you interact with us. So Teams Live, the platform that we're using here, doesn't allow you to uh, speak to us directly, but you can talk in real time via the Q&A. So I'm going to man that in the background while Ray Wayne is running through the content. Uh, if there's any relevant questions I can pick up as we go, I'll make sure I do pick them up. Um, if they're relevant to uh, the entire group, then I'll, I'll publish those across everybody and um, we'll probably save a few of those till towards the end of the session to um, to ask live. You know, if there's anything for John um, when we get into that or where anything for Wayne specifically towards the end of the session, then uh, we'll pick that up. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to Wayne just to say hello. You probably know who he is, colleague of mine. We work pretty closely together over the last few years. Um, so yeah, I will pass over to Wayne. Wayne, uh, if you want mind a little introduction and then let me know when you want your slides on the screen. Thanks. Superb, thank you very much, James. That is a very nice Miami Mice shirt, Crockett and Tubbs style. I'm, I appreciate any reference to the 80s. So, uh, okay, to the matter at hand, today's session is all about uh, PCI DSS and specifically, um, how uh, industry is taking a view of PCI DSS and, and regulation, specifically the law um, and the view that the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, takes on uh, GDPR inherited as the Data Protect Protection Act uh, and the view that has on an industry standard like PCI DSS. So I mean, I've, I've been asking the question, um, is PCI DSS viewed as law? Because it's a standard, it's not a regulation, it's not an EU directive, it's an industry standard. So um, taking different approaches uh, to meeting those standards is based on a merchant's view of risk in any industry. So whether you're a college, a university, a local authority working in the retail sector, the finance sector, the regulations and the standards are the same, but they will affect you slightly differently given other regulations that apply to you. So a really good example of that is something that I, I noted a number of, number of years ago when people were using um, call, pause and resume technology to hopefully remove the card data from scope for their from, from their environment to make them fully PCI compliant, which unfortunately it didn't. But one thing it did do is it got them in trouble with the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, because using pause and resume is basically not allowed. If you're if you are transacting in the financial world and you are governed by the FCA, all calls should be recorded in their entirety for legal purposes. 
So as such, pausing that call for PCI DSS purposes was breaking the law to meet a, an industry standard. So that's that's where you get these crossovers of industry standards and uh, legal obligations, and they can get quite confusing. And what we try to do with conversations with our customers and merchants is try and simplify that by taking you know a number of different approaches, but, but one single one that I want to put some emphasis on today. I'm also going to be having a conversation with John Greenwood. I've got a, a set of trip him up questions um, to try and get the best out of his great knowledge when it comes to call center security and that moto environment uh, when that applies to PCI DSS. So that that certainly is essential listening and, and we will get on to the regulatory bit towards the end of the session, which should last for about another 54 minutes, approximately something like that. So on that, if uh, James could pop my slides on and I'll go through the deck, that would be appreciated. Yeah, they're on for you now. That's superb. So I'm going to start off with a quick video I put together um, uh, just for video's sake. Ah, thank goodness, Axis. You can help, I hope. What's the problem, Cash? It's this PCI DSS thing. It's so complicated. Sit down, Axis. How am I going to complete these forms? I need help. Don't worry, Cash. We have help and information on hand. Phew, that's a relief, Access. Let's watch the Pay360 webinar on PCI DSS. Will it help, Access? It has before. I'm in then. Great, that's the video out of the way. And I can thank my wife for the voiceover. It's much appreciated. So let's dive straight in. Before we start, I don't want to make any presumptions or assumptions around the uh, the audience level of engagement with PCI DSS. So please use the Q&A either anonymously or, or with your name and organization to ask any questions at all with regards uh, the standards um, and anything to do with card processing and security. What I'd like to do is give an outline of how we got here uh, uh, as an industry and, and, and where things began um, as far as you know, Visa, MasterCard, Discover, JCB, all of the major card brands coming together to make a set of standards to hopefully secure the payment infrastructure. Um, PCI DSS was born from those card, card brands and has now spent the last 13 or so years applying standards that have made iter iterative changes based on technology uh, as modernization of payment mechanisms has, com has come into place. Um, it's important to know that the version that we're going to be talking about today is the current version, version 3.2.1, but we will also be looking at the next version, version four, and I also have um, a recording from yesterday um, from a colleague, uh, an industry colleague of both John's and mine called Jeremy King. Now he's the head of PCI DSS uh, in Europe. He ran a session yesterday. Uh, he wanted to be here today, but he already had a pre-booking. Um, so he ran a session yesterday for an industry group called Vendacom. Uh, it's free to join for all merchants, so I'd, I'd advise you all to have a look at that group because some of the information that comes out from that group with regards payment security is almost essential listening. What's PCI DSS? The payment card industry data security standards. I think we all pretty much know what that is, otherwise we, we wouldn't be here on the session today. And it's looking at the detail of PCI DSS that can sometimes turn a business off from engaging with it fully. When you look at it at a high level, it has six goals. Oh, that, that can't be too difficult. Oh, those six goals are now broken down into 12 PCI DSS requirements. Once again, not too difficult, that's fine. And then we start looking at the granular controls. There are over 329 controls that apply to PCI DSS, and that's where things start getting you know, slightly sticky and awkward. And you can take a number of different approaches to compliance. One's prescriptive, literally looking at the standards, the controls that are required, 
and applying them to your existing infrastructure. Now that can be a very, very difficult way to approach the project. It's facilitated by the PCI DSS who have provided the standards and the framework free of charge. They've also provided a number of tools that allow you to manage the implementation of the security protocols. Um, there's a number of spreadsheets online, guidelines, um, taking uh, a, a prioritized approach to the way you implement PCI DSS. And if you're just at the beginning of your journey, I would, I would certainly direct you to the PCI DSS website and those tools. Depending obviously on your merchant size, you may want to engage a QSA, an external quality uh, security assessor, or you may want to invest in training for your own staff and have an internal security assessor, which in, in the longer term may save money, certainly assists with the implementation of security within your environment. But also I think the more knowledge you and your staff have over PCI DSS, when it comes to that annual certification, or if it's not annual, if there's been a, a significant change in your environment on change, then an ISA would most certainly help. The, the next approach is a risk-based one. A risk-based approach is something that a lot of merchants take based on the fact that PCI DSS isn't classed as law. And when you look at you know, decision makers within business, they will take a view of the cost of securing that entire infrastructure when taking a prescriptive approach, ticking those 329 controls and the cost applied to that, and then the basic fact that their company's been fine. It's been fine for the last 10 years, securing it with what they have and what they do using their security layers and their network access and controls to facilitate security of the environment, it's fine. It'll never happen to them. That risk-based approach is now viewed very, very differently in law. And we'll understand more of that and how it's viewed as we go through the presentation. In my opinion, PCI DSS is all around those following words, scope, scope, scope. Your card data environment is your risk point. It's where you become liable to criminals, to social engagement with your staff by criminals, phishing attacks, malicious malware, mistakes. The less risk is applied to the most reduced scope and card data environment that you can have as an organization, as a merchant. And there are ways to get there. There are technologies and methods that can be employed by your organization to, re to remove both the risk and scope. So we know PCI DSS is the payment industry data security standards, securing credit and debit card information. We know the card schemes at the top level manage that infrastructure. So Visa, MasterCard, Diners, uh, Amex, and others. But below that, that's where they start engaging with us as payment service providers, acquirers, and then yourselves as merchants. And then right at the bottom, cardholders. Shockingly, PCI DSS doesn't apply to cardholders. They, they have a get out of jail free card. But everybody else above that, with the exception strangely within their environment of acquirers, and that is being reviewed by the PCI DSS, uh, PCI DSS applies to. Okay, I just popped this slide up as, as a point of interest looking at fraud, because I always, when having conversations around PCI DSS, encounter uh, a, a misunderstanding of the standards, why they're there, and how they are applied. So if we look at the screen that I've just shared, and you may see this when people are talking about PCI DSS and security as a whole, especially when we when we look towards fraud and, and fraud losses in particular, and the increase in fraud when it comes to remote purchase, customer not present transactions, and the technologies that are used either over the phone 
where the major increase of fraud is or online strangely enough pci dss does not apply to this i have seen fraudulent card pages online taking payments either in bitcoin or in credit and debit card that say they are pci dss compliant pci dss does not relate to fraudulent card transactions pci dss relates to the way you store transmit card data not fraudulent transactions so that split ensures that you you concentrate your efforts when it comes to compliance in the right area pci dss is not cyber security cyber security is not pci dss there is obviously an overlap when it comes to technologies and the use of payment mechanisms but they are certainly different things and that is the only reason that's there and we have sessions running led by our fraud specialist russell wilkinson over the coming weeks on fraud kyc and anti-money laundering so i'm going to fly through these next slides very very quickly because i do have an in-depth update from jeremy king that i want to allude to it's just an update on pci dss version 4 um the latest timelines and updates of when that's due uh, and as i say i'm not going to focus too much on the detail here because jeremy kindly has covered this within his session um we're going through an rfc process at the moment yeah, it's just coming to an end request for change there has been over 3,000 amendments made to the standards um, as first submitted by the security standards council um, and that's through feedback from participating organizations such as pay 360 and compliance 3. Um, those changes you will see have changed PCI DSS forevermore. Um, and we'll touch on it when I'm having a conversation with John, but the information within the standards now will allude to the supporting guidelines that are also um, submitted by the Security Standards Council. Um, because a lot of those documents are not taken as seriously as they should be. So looking at the development timeline, we're looking at 2021, 2022 for the release of version four. In the interim, ensure that you retain your compliance with version 3.2.1. There is a transi uh, transition period in between 2021, 2023, from 321 to version 4 that will be managed by the security standards council and supported by merchant acquiring services and payment service providers alike to ensure that all merchants are fully kept up to date with those changes as they are happening so i've probably said too much on that already because jeremy's going to cover a lot of it so there's a guidance document that is essential reading John Greenwood, who's on the call today, uh, input a great deal into this from a special interest group uh, a couple of years ago. But PCI DSS, when applied to your environment, specific to Moto and call center environments, is now more relevant than ever, specifically when it, when it comes to home working and the change in environment. Uh, the change in environment has changed your infrastructure and your scope of PCI DSS. And we'll come back to that with the conversation uh, with John. There's lots of assistive documents online. Um, when it comes to home working um, and coronavirus, the ICO has also got a number of assistive documents online specific to home working, what you need to know and what security protocols should be applied to your infrastructure whilst working from home. So whether as an, as an organization you have shifted your staff to a home working environment temporarily, or some organizations have now made the, the key decision now to make that permanent move, this is all essential reading. So the ICO view on uh, PCI DSS is all related to its interpretation of GDPR and the Data Protection Act. Um, here's an example. 
the example is a section from the ICO website and it, um, it alludes to PCI DSS uh, from uh, the standards as they applied. I'm, I'm going to read this out. If you are processing payment card data, you are obliged to comply with the payment card industry data security standard. PCI DSS outlines a number of specific technical and organizational measures that the payment card industry considers, considers applicable whenever such data is being processed. Although compliance with PCI DSS is not necessarily equivalent to compliance with the GDPR security principle, if you process card data and suffer a personal data breach, the ICO will consider to the extent to which you have put these in place measures that PCI DSS requires, particularly if the breach is related to a lack of a particular control or process mandated by the standards. So basically what the ICO is saying under the guise of GDPR and the Data Protection Act is you as a merchant are obliged to comply with PCI DSS. That's an important clarification that they have made on the website derived from law. Worryingly, sustainability of PCI DSS and trends since 2016 have gone down. So compliance um, from organizations of all types when it comes to the, the attestation of their compliance using either QSAs or self-assessments has gone down quite considerably. Now that is worrying and concerning. And the PCI DSS is looking to address that by way of education. And that is their, their, their key word of the moment. Asking payment service providers such as Pay360, um, compliance advisors such as Compliance3, ensuring that merchants are engaged and get the message that PCI DSS compliance is absolutely essential. So on that, I'm going to pass over to Jeremy King, who recorded a session yesterday uh, for us whilst delivering a message to the Vendicom group, which is a group of acquirers, merchants, payment service providers, card issuers and the PCI DSS. Um, uh, and the advice itself, although he wanted to deliver it in person today, is essential. So I'm just going to play this last around 20 minutes, but is absolutely essential. We've all heard of the film, The Day the Earth Stood Still. Well, for most people, 2020 is the year the Earth stood still. And we've all had a lot of challenges and a lot of difficulties throughout this year. Uh, many of those have related to, to how we work and what we're doing and, and, and certainly around how we are managing and using payments. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that and a few things on the catch up of what's been happening within PCI SSE and I'll, I've noted a couple of things down of other areas that I can catch up on and certainly at the end, you know, feel free to ask any questions on, on any topic that's uh, related to PCI and I'll, I'll try and answer them. I always do my best and if not, if I can't answer them, then very happy to, uh, to take the notes and, and find the answer from the people who do. So just before we kick off, uh, a quick look at um, the PCI SSC. Um, our mission is simple, it's to help secure payment data. Um, we go about this by developing standards and supporting services that drive education, awareness and effective implementation. We do this using three, uh, sorry, four strategic pillars that are aimed at increasing industry participation and knowledge, evolve security standards and validation, <coughs> excuse me, secure emerging payment channels and increase standards and alignments and consistency. And really being here and talking to everyone and listening to you and getting involved with you and doing the community meetings and lots of other things are all about those four things. We really want to listen to you because we consider it as a community, we consider ourselves working together with you guys because we really want to help protect that cardholder payment. It's interesting, I'm just going to go on a, a little tangent here. We did some internal training the other, the other week and the trainer said, so who's going to stand up and tell us the PCI mission statement? Uh, and I use it and say it 
regularly and everyone else was sort of all looking at their toes and it's like yeah you know when someone asks you to actually say it off the top of your head it's like mm, yeah i don't want to get it wrong but it's there you can see it so uh, that is what we're about and really we're helping to do that working together so let's take a look back at the years bc or as they're now known before covid um life although we didn't realize it was very simple we went to the office, we logged onto our computers and we worked happily away. We had meetings, we worked in teams, we chatted with our friends at lunchtime and we all hated going into the office. And now six months later, seven months later, we all want to go back to the office and hopefully some of you are back in the office. But it's interesting that we took these pleasures so much for granted. Uh, and something else that was behind that, that we really took for granted and never really thought about was just how safe and secure our work environment was. Because we were in, we, we love the word bubble now, government's got to have a bubble. So we were in our bubble. Our bubble was our office environment because we were inside and we were using the internet, the company's internet. We had firewalls, we had DMZs to protect us. Our computers were running updated software. We had secure log on procedures. We had a password policy and we attended our regular security training. And if that doesn't sound familiar to any of you, then, well, that's what our security assessors were telling us when they were auditing you because you were ticking all those boxes and saying you were doing that. But essentially, for the most part, we were pretty safe and protected. And if anything went wrong, if you got stuck, you would pick up the phone and the IT department would come around and definitely sort you out. And it was all very nice and worked very well. Uh, and then COVID came and then lockdown came and the world changed and we meet from we moved from BC to a AL after lockdown and life and work changed completely we're now at home the kids are at home the pets are at home we're all at home it's become rather complicated the house is rather busy uh, and we're all trying to work and the kids are either online schooling or online gaming but whatever they're doing they're using all the bandwidth and we're trying to work and do all these zoom meetings as well uh, and we're running all this through our local home router, whichever provider is providing us that, with ever, which, with ever or whatever password and default passwords they've set into that router. Who knows? Um, and we also get the speed that we get, and that's it. So it's a challenge. It's a simple challenge. We've moved outside that bubble. We're now disconnected in a way. But for the vast majority of us, we're on our own we're now on our own and we're working from our spare bedroom or if we're lucky to have a study or if we're lucky to have a basement or a, or a cellar but we're working from home and we're meeting through zoom or teams or webex or skype or whichever media platform your organizations use and, and we tried to make do but then we started reading the reports of security issues and the criminals going crazy and you only need to scratch the surface and start doing some simple searches and you'll see just how busy the criminals have been this is this year's been a feeding frenzy for the criminals they've just been completely seeing that they can break into organizations they can steal things they can use ransomware they can do so many things and they're doing it fast and furious and why is this well, very simply, as I said, we're outside the bubble, the safe haven that was the office. Now we're connected, not through the office, but we're connected using our local router, using your local provider across the world wide web into your organization. You're now operating remotely and connected into your company's network. Yet, how are you achieving this? How are you authenticated? What are your permissions when you're going on there? Your company's going from having these very closed down, secure network and systems to having more connections than network rail. And what's the risk? Technology is the risk. And with the risk comes opportunity for the criminals. And as I've said, they're having a feeding frenzy this year. And the other side of the risk is us. We're humans, we are social animals and we don't like missing out on talking to our friends and colleagues. We like that opportunity to go and have a coffee with somebody or go and have some time at lunch. We chatted about everything. We chatted about what we'd watched on television or what had been happening, but we also chatted about work. And so when we're at home, when we are alone, we do the next best thing. 
and we start reaching out using social media. And yet what starts out as a friendly chat on social media suddenly moves into work. And now we're talking about work related items about work matters across an insecure social media platform. And the cr criminals are listening and they're noting down and they're finding this information. I mean, back in World War Two, the message was clear. Careless talk costs lives and it did. Today, the message is equally true because careless talk costs data and careless talk can lead to phishing attacks. And that is one of the things that has gone through the roof. The phishing attacks are where the criminals are trying to find a way into your system. And now it's so much easier. And as I said, we've got all these different connections. And so they're, they're, they're using the phishing attacks. The common ones now are that they're ringing you up and pretending to be your IT department because they know you've got a few problems. Working from home, who hasn't got problems at the moment? And so they'll start asking you for the logon details. They'll start asking you for the permissions. They'll start finding details about you so they can then start connecting into your systems. One of the types of attack that we're seeing growing rapidly is ransomware. Ransomware is a wonderful thing for the criminals because it gets money straight into them. There's no messing about. You have to pay the ransom to get your data back. Who doesn't want their data back? So we're seeing a large rise in this. We're seeing the criminals coming in, pretending to be IT support, getting that malware into the systems through your computer, through the network, because we haven't got those levels of security built in anymore. The other one that's new coming along is they're pretending to be the HR department. They've picked up through social media that you've joined this company or that you're working from home and they're just, you know, they're reaching out to you because you've been working from home for the last six months. They're a caring community, they're a caring company. So they want to find out if you're coping because we're aware of this, of the mental challenges of being alone and working from home. So the HR starts off by calling you and just asking how you're feeling and how you're getting on. And they'll just gradually start getting into more detail until they start finding out the information they want. So you need to have these things sorted. You need to think about what is the impact of working remotely and working from home. And that's where the council fit stands in and fits in and starts helping out. So we've been very busy. We've been doing a lot throughout this year and we've been producing a lot of guidance around all sorts of areas to try and help organisations during this, this, this COVID crisis. Um, the things we've covered for one of the biggest things we've had to change from the council's perspective is our training. Our training had to move online, which you know we could do. We had most of the training set up already. The big thing was to move the uh, to move the exam process online, and and that was a major a major change for us. And it also introduced some new challenges. In that I was talking to uh, someone at, at the North American Community Meeting who just undergone some training and does the exam, and he said when he logged on to the exam process. The first thing he was asked to do was to take his camera and spin it through 360 degrees so that the examiners could see his room to make sure they hadn't got another computer set up with all the answers or he hadn't got all the answers pasted over the all over the walls and that actually he'd been working very hard and revising to make sure that he could pass the exam which he did so this there's changes like that has, have had to come along another one that we've we've had to take into consideration and, and this one really does affect you all is how we do assessments a lot of the pci standards and requirements need or or, or require an annual assessment well how do you do an annual assessment when you don't allow anyone into your office well we have to or your or your merchant location and so we've had to create guidance on remote assessments. We've done remote assessment guidance for the assessor community because we want them to be able to understand how to do this correctly. But we've also provided more guidance on remote assessments for your perspective. What are you expecting to see? And it's been interesting that in the conversations we've had with the uh, with the QSAs, one of the things that's changed is is just it's a bit like the exam. It's the preparedness. It's, it's the preparations of getting everything in place for the for the actual assessment, and that is taking a lot longer. The assessment is taking a lot longer, and so the QSAs are having to work a lot harder to get everything ready, so everything's in order to be able to see them. Other things that we've had to do, and 
work on? Well, we've had to change some of our expiry, expiry dates on our PTS devices because of delivery problems earlier on. Uh, and also, you know, more guidance on working remotely and how to do that securely. Going forward throughout the year, we've kept that uh, guidance coming. We've, we've, we've provided more guidance on being aware of the skimming threats of protecting payments while working remotely. And we'll talk more about this. I know I know we've got the Moto session this afternoon and uh, I, I know John will be talking a lot about this. Because we've moved the call centre staff from working in a call centre to working from home. And now we've got cardholder data coming across the networks into your organisation, into your staff's home environment and that's really important we need to consider that because when you're working from home the person the customer doesn't know that you're at home they don't know where you are and so as they're on the telephone or they're using e and commerce and they're entering their cardholder details that is going through the systems and it's arriving at a person's home so it's really important to understand how you're managing that data. How are you keeping that cardholder data secure? How are you training your staff to understand that when they're working from home, they have to be careful about what they're writing down. Again, you're outside the bubble of the office. And so in someone's home, if you put it in, the, in, in your bin and throw the bin out, it, there's cardholder data there. So we need to make sure that wherever possible, cardholder data is not being written down, that if it is being written down, it's being shredded or destroyed or made unreadable before it gets thrown away. We need to understand how you're going to send that cardholder data across the networks. Again, when you were in the office, you, you were inside, you're in the internet, so it's quite easy. But now that cardholder data is going across public networks. If it's going across a public network, then it has to be encrypted. It has to be encrypted to the required level. And we've moved away from SSL. So we need to make sure that this is going to happen securely. We want to make sure it's going to keep protecting that cardholder data. And why do we need to do that? As I said right at the start, we're seeing increased criminal activity. This is from a recent report from Interpol. Uh, I actually think these figures are remarkably low but they show that the phishing attacks have grown by 59%, that malware attacks have grown by 36%. The criminals, as I said, are really active in this after lockdown period. They are making a lot of money. And so we need to understand the risk. We need to make sure that all of our staff understand that. We need to have clear policies and training in place to make sure it's never been more important. Multi-factor authentication for logon, absolutely critical. It is so important that your staff are authenticating themselves so that we can have some confidence that the right person is logging on, confidence that that, that, that connection between their home environment and the office is secure, and confidence that all of the data that's going across there is secure. And we're looking after that cardholder data. So as the scouts always say, always be prepared. And that is what we have to do as we continue to have to work in this in this after lockdown period of, of working remotely. And again, I talk to a lot of people, the dates that people are now saying for people getting back to normal is moving back and back and back. We, we, you know, I'm hearing a lot of people saying it's going to be middle of 2021 before they're back to working normally increasingly I'm hearing companies going actually we're not actually we don't need to bring people back in the office we've found that the the level and quality of the work is 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 is, work, is, is remaining because we're very conscientious people actually I mean I've worked from home for the last 10 years and one of the things I know is you work harder you, you, you tend not to take as many breaks, you tend, you're not disturbed because people aren't just walking past and chatting. So you're doing more work and, and actually companies are finally realizing this and going, actually, you know, our productivity has gone up. Uh, and so for a lot of organizations, they're thinking, well, we don't need to. We'll, we'll see, we'll, we'll keep this working from home environment or, you know, we'll reduce the number of offices. I think in the, in the near future, you're going to see a lot of office space in the major cities becoming available. You know, if, if for, for a lot of people I've talked to who worked in London, the one thing they all hated was the commute. And if you don't have to commute and you're already living in a wonderful, beautiful part of, of the UK, brilliant, you know. And what we're seeing is the small towns, and I live in a small town, becoming 
much busier. I, I've seen the number of people walking around in town. The coffee shops are all busy. The restaurants are all busy. Whether that will stay busy over the next few weeks. I'm in East Cheshire. We've gone to level two. Whatever that means, but I'm in level two now. Um, but we'll see. So anyway, being prepared. So if you've got staff working from home, make sure they're working in a suitable area. You know, we don't want people being disturbed. I did this, I did a presentation, honestly, this is so funny. I did a presentation last week. I got to this stage and said, you must make sure you're not prepared, not being disturbed. My wife walked in fully. I was like, no, you couldn't have time walking in. As I've just said, do not be disturbed. And she walks just to make sure if I was finishing on time and wanted wanted the evening meal. Ah, joys. Um, so understand where you work, understand that if you're working there when handling cardholder data, you need to secure that environment. Um, understand how you're connecting to your organisation, know how to do that securely. Make sure you're using multi-factor authentication. Have, have a policy of how you're going to identify when staff are calling you for or pretending to call you from work whether that's a, an email that comes that says, by the way, I'm going to call you in 30 seconds, Dunk. or I'm going to use this password when I call you, or, you know, some method of being able to clarify this person is who they say they are. And it's the same when you're ringing in. If you're ringing into them, then you need to have the same level of, of confidence that it, you are the person you say you are. So have that method of identifying. Security training, even remotely, has never been more important. So raise awareness of the common techniques, the phishing calls, the emails. These are the attacks the criminals are using. Have a policy for how your organisation is going to talk to each other because they are going to talk to each other. Do not think that they will not be talking to each other. So have a process that you can control. You may not, you know, the people are using social media because they think they don't want you listening in to private conversations. So look at how you can do that. In a, in a controlled way that's not social media. And then think about how you're managing cardholder data. Because as I say, we may be working like this for quite some time, so we need to get it right. So now I'd like to move on and talk about a couple of the PCI standards that are, that are coming through and, and some of the changes that we're seeing. Then we'll start the transition period from 3.2.1 to version 4 around the middle of next year and that's going to run for 18 months. We'll run that um, transition period through till the middle to the well through to the start of 2023 before PCI DSS 321 is retired and then version 4 becomes effective but even then as we've done with other standards where there are new requirements they will have um, they will have future dates so everyone gets used to them. We won't always want people to get used to them. With DSS4, there's a lot to get used to because we've now got the new customized approach and there is a lot to get used to there. So we're moving away from um, compensating controls, compensating controls vanish. They're no longer going to be compensating controls in version four. They're going to be replaced by customized approach. What this means, if you, if you have been using compensating controls, then you need to start planning early how to turn that into a customized approach. You can't just on the day the uh, QSA arrives go, oh, we haven't met that, let's do a, a, a customized approach. Not going to work. <clears throat> you need to get prepared earlier to make sure that, oh, we're not going to meet this. How can we meet it? Well, we've got all of these other features in place, all these other security requirements that, that show that we easily meet that requirement. Right, we'll get that sorted out and then you can utilize it. So it's, it's a change of how are you going to utilize the standard when this does come through. So there's a lot to think about and we'll keep you all informed as we go through this process. Um, but that's it. That's a quick run through of the council. Um, as you saw, this is me in my office and yeah, I, I work from home. Uh, it is possible. It's possible to do it securely. Um, Let's all stay healthy, healthy. Let's stay safe and secure and do enjoy the rest of the event. That was a great update from Jeremy um, and it invoked a lot of conversation yesterday uh, and we hope to invoke the, the same types of discussion from yourselves today and over the over the coming weeks. So hopefully you found that of use, which was the main reason I wanted you to listen to that. It was direct 
from the horse's mouth. Um, there's a, a great deal of detail specifically around um, the approach to version four and the fact that compensating controls are going away. Love them or hate them. I always found them as pretty much excuses for not doing what you should do. They will be removed and you will now be able to use a customized approach. So let's look at what we can do uh, if things go wrong, because the customers, unfortunately, don't blame you know the, the card acquirers, the technology, PCI DSS, uh, when things go wrong, they blame the merchant, the, the person that they've made a payment do, you know, to. So what can Pay360 do to help? This is just a, a short example of one of the de-scoping products that are available from Pay360 to reduce both risk and scope for PCI DSS. Call Secure from Pay360 is a risk and compliance tool that helps with PCI DSS. Let's take a quick look at how it could help you reduce PCI burden. That's fine, I'm sure we can sort that out. Bear with me, I'm logging onto the system now. Do you have your account number available? Not to hand, no. That's fine. I'm sure I'll be able to retrieve that from our balance records. Let me see now. Okay, no. Yep, so I've located that. You do have an outstanding balance of £900, Mr. Tom Jones. Were you aware of that? Uh, it's not unusual. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, as agreed, we'll take a payment of £150 against the account and I shall make a note of that on the system. I will be transferring you over to our secure payment solution in a moment. Uh, please bear with me. Okie dokie, no probs. Enter your token. Token valid. Now complete the handover. OK, Mr. Jones, I'll transfer you now. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you for waiting. Please press the star key on your telephone keypad in order to go ahead with your payment. You will now hear a set of prompts which will guide you through entering your card details using the keys on your telephone keypad. Key in your payment card number in full, followed by the star key. Please hold for a few seconds whilst we check your payment card. Thank you for waiting. Key in the four numbers of the card end or expiry date, ignoring any slash or space. Key in the card security code. That's the last three numbers on the signature strip on the back of the card. So you want to make a payment of 150 pounds. To complete the payment, press the star key. Otherwise, press the hash key. Please hold for a few seconds whilst we check your payment. Payment has been accepted. You may wish to note the authorization code, which is 102702, and our reference, which is 95. Thank you for using our payment service. Goodbye. So that's just one example of how Pay360 can help in reducing the risk and scope um, for PCI DSS. And there are a number of other solutions where we can look to divert that, that card data away from your environment using digital channels and technology, uh, signposting methods. We can certainly advise in a number of different instances, given a, no a number of different scenarios where you engage with your customers to ensure 
that you remove the card data risk and liability from both your staff and your organization's infrastructure. So saying that a conversation has to be had within your organization across all sectors. So universities, colleges, local authorities, public and private sector, as we touched on earlier on, these standards apply to anybody that has a merchant number that processes credit and debit card information, even if it's fully outsourced. So what I'd like to do if <clears throat> technology allows is have a quick conversation, just five minutes or so with John Greenwood from Compliance 3, who has over 20 years experience in call center environments and securing that infrastructure. So hopefully with that, John, are you there? I'm here, Wayne. Superb, you do sound like you're on the other side of the world, but that's absolutely fine given the technology problems we're all having working from home. Um, Very kind. I, is that a bit better? It is. That's absolutely perfect. Thank you. So I've got a number of questions, John, for you that I was hoping to ask that you could expand on. Um, hmm. The first one being, what are the most common mistakes and misconceptions made by clients when starting the compliance journey? Hey, you start off with the good ones, don't you? <laughs> Sorry, apologies. <laughs> common mistakes. I'll tell you how I'm going to answer that. I'm going to answer that by saying, where does it all go wrong and why? Right? Mm -hmm. Where does it all go wrong and why? So that should identify the mistakes. Right? Number one is support at, at, at senior decision making level. That's going to be your, you know, the, the senior decision making team, the board. It's where the governance of the organization sits. There needs to be a champion there and not getting those people engaged, right? Not getting them to really get behind the project, that's the first mistake, right? That's the first mistake, mm -hmm. right? Second mistake, right? Second mistake, just get your arms around it. Understand the scope. People forget um, that it's all about scope. You were chatting earlier, Jeremy was chatting. It's all about scope. You've got to get your arms around it. And the easiest way to do it, in other words, if you'd done it this way, you wouldn't have cocked up, right? <laughs> is 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 to break it down into each payment acceptance channel, right? Now, then, if you're a level three and above, you've got the option to attest, and by that I mean like certify in each payment acceptance channel. That's face to face, e-com, and moto, right? But unless you break the project down at that level right off the bat, it's a cock up. Right, you've made a mistake, right? So that's the second area. Good technical right? term, I like, yes. Yeah, understand. cock up, cock up. You, cock up usually, usually I find sort of embraces everyone. You know, we can all it, understand. It certainly we gets the understand. attention, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So third cock up area, right? Third cock up area, this is a good one, right? You've got to recognize that, that, that when you're doing this sort of stuff, You've got to recognize, and it's a mistake if you don't, that payment card data is just very sexy personal data. And by very sexy, what I mean is that it gets criminals super, super excited because they can get it exchanged into cash really quickly. Mm -hmm. And like all of us, right, they're not spending much cash at the moment because you can't go out and spend it. Right? So, so it's yeah. goodness. It's all gold to them, right? But they can swap it into money real easily, a lot more than a name and address. So they're looking for it. If you've got a lot of it, that's sexy. So understand that. Understand your enemy, because the enemy here is the criminal, right? Yep. And they don't do good things with it. They don't give it to the UN for World Food Programme, right? No, right? they don't bother with that. Right? Low hanging fruit. Low hanging fruit, right? So in that scope thing, another mistake is forgetting it's stored processed and transmitted yeah stored yes. process and transmitted and the yep. final area right that i'd throw into this answer of where people make mistakes is dealing with or recognizing firstly recognizing and really holding feet to the fire for those third 
third-party service providers. And yep. I've spelt that out, third-party service providers, because it's got a definition. It's got a definition in the council documentation. But for ease, clarity, yeah, if you're a merchant and you support the payments for another merchant, you're a third-party service provider. And if you're not a merchant, but you help somebody else or could influence the security of helping somebody of card data, you know, whilst you're helping somebody out, you're mm -hmm. a third party service provider. So that's Pay360, right? I yep. know you've got, you know, you get managed, don't you? Right? We do. You do get managed. And, and so that's Pay360. But it's also the people hosting your website that are linked to your merchant account, right? That have got an integration to Pay360. Connected they're to. Connected to. They're helping, right? Because if you yep. take them out of the picture, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. It's your contact center provider, your cloud-based contact center as a service provider, right? Yeah. The people who are hosting your switch, right? It's those guys too. So think of it. The easiest way to think of a third-party service provider, thread a piece of string, follow the data. The data is the piece of string. And if you have to thread it through a of an entity that isn't you, right, they're in it. You need a contract from them to say they take responsibility. You need their attestation of compliance. And most importantly, you need a, a responsibilities matrix. And yes. here's, the, here's one final cock up. You have one final cock up. It's all right asking for an attestation, right? That's great. You've ticked the box there for sure. But if it hasn't got the contracted party's name on it, Ask why, because it's not them that's certified as compliant, is it? No. Right? It's that other party. And, and when you look at, oh, it's all right, we're in AWS. We're in AWS, we're fine. We'll give you AWS's attestation of compliance. Wrong mistake, cock up, right? Because when you look at who's responsible for that attestation, in other words, if you look at AWS's um, responsibilities matrix every requirement is either shared with the entity or it sits with the entity yes and it's understanding those responsibilities absolutely <clears throat> absolutely one, one thing john and i'm just wary of time i'm, I'm going to ask you mm. one more question and, and we'll, we'll try and fire this off quite quickly who if any individual should champion the PCI project within an organization? Who would they be? Yeah. Treasury. When it sits in IT, right, those guys are busy. They're just facilitating getting stuff done, right? That's their mm -hmm. job. It's a cock up. If it sits with IT, it's a cock up. It doesn't get done because they're too busy. Treasury should own it and Treasury should be backed up by two sets of people. One is that champion at senior exec level who sits on the top exec team. And the other people is your data governance, whoever's in charge of data governance, right? That's who they're the two people that they need support from the top down and they need the data governance support. Because and it, and it's, 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 getting, it's getting the ear of that person of, at the top as well. I've seen- No, no, know, mate, no, it's not getting the ear. It's not getting the ear. It's the whole person. You yes. can survive with one ear, right? <laughs> You've got to get the head in it. You've got to get the head in it and get in the body so the head's just not on his own because a dead head is worth nothing. You've got to have a real person who speaks, I right, who's behind you. All right. Okay. No, thank you, John. No, given time, we are going to have to cut things slightly shorter than we wanted to, and we are going to run another one of these sessions with considerably more time set to one side for a further conversation with John because he is a, a font of knowledge and we really want to explore that quite further. Um, so I, I appreciate the time you've put aside, John. Um, so I just want to sort of close before I hand back to James on the white paper that you've been working on and further information that's available from Pay360 supported by Compliance3 and just put some real emphasis on the message that regulation is part of the cha changing compliance landscape. So those industry standards should be viewed along with your regulatory requirements. Pay360 offer a 
number of payment channel interaction points that are all secured in different ways. But PCI DSS, when it comes to people process technology, needs to be taken account of when it comes to how you use those products. And that's something that John can assist with as an individual, completely separate organization that's not associated to Pay360 to give independent advice on how you can implement PCI DSS thoroughly. So I thank you for that, John. So on that, I'll hand back to James just to see if there's any Q&A to clear up. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, appreciate that, guys. You know, also appreciate, like Wayne says, um, John, you uh, sparing the time and, and dialing in. It's a bit like being on the radio, actually, given that he was dialed in over the phone, but really interesting stuff. Um, yes, there have been a couple of questions, and I, I know that I've not managed to get through them all in response, and I know that we, you know, some of the ones that were lined up for John, we didn't get to. So um, please do join, you know, the, the other PCI session that we run. Um, Wayne, I'm going to fire these at you, and if we need to, uh, you know, ask John to unmute his mic again and jump in, that we may have to do that. Um, first and foremost, how do you access an ISA? So ISAs are all listed at, uh, on the PCI DSS website. They all um, uh, scanning service providers have to go through an accreditation with the Security Standards Council. So uh, in essence, don't do a search for ISAs on Google and pick the first one that's uh, decided to advertise on there. Go and use um, an approved and certified QSA slash ISA service that is promoted and listed on the PCI DSS website. Perfect, thank you. Um, so the next question that we have got here is, what is the relation between PCI DSS and PSD2 and SCA? Bit of a long one, bit of a mouthful, but hopefully you've got that. It is, I might, I might bring John in on this because the relationship between the two is they're both related to payments. That's if John's still there. Yeah, still here. So the relationship, John, between PCI DSS, PSD2 and SCA. OK, so easiest one to to clarify there is this SCA, strong customer authentication, is part of PSD2. Uh, PSD2 is the payment services directive. It's the second part of that, second and final part of that. And what the uh, PSD2 is, in a nutshell, is the legal framework that allows us as data subjects to actually pay for things directly with our bank accounts. And strong customer authentication within that is the two-factor authentication uh, structure that checks it's our bank account that the money is coming out of, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and actually, the GDPR, General Data, General Data Protection Regulation, Data Protection Act 2018, is, is actually in place to make sure that everybody's keeping our data secure so people know it's us who's authenticating our money to mm -hmm. go and pay somebody. So that's how the two, two are linked. Now the PCI DSS, right, separate from that, that's come from the card schemes and that's a contractual obligation between the card schemes, MasterCard, Visa, JCB, Amex, et cetera, Discovery, right, and the acquiring banks. And what the acquiring banks do is they pass those contractual obligations on to merchants, and then merchants have that contractual obligation to make sure the third parties they introduce all keep the uh, uh, card schemes data secure, just like the General Data Protection, the Data Protection Act keeps our data secure. Yes, yep. understood. So almost very similar to a slide I showed, you will not have seen it, John, unfortunately, on the phone, at the beginning showing fraud rates on the increase. Now that, very interestingly, would be addressed by the regulation outlined in PSD2, whereas PCI DSS is all about the merchant and the way they handle the data and, and making sure it's secure. And, yeah, and the, the third, third party parties. services that are helping them. Never exactly. forget the third parties, Wayne, I promise. Exactly. There you go. Thank you, John. OK, great. Uh, and there is one more question that hopefully we've got time for. Um, are Capita able to provide a service to validate PCI compliance? So what, because you cannot police yourself, 
So if we provide services directly to a merchant, um, it would be untoward for us to go and check the compliance, which is why we engage a third party independent advisory service such as Compliance 3 to outline and define the scope of liability and the uh, and, and to analyze the compliance status of both the payment services that are being provided by their payment service provider, but also very, very importantly, they focus on the impact internally within the merchant when it comes to people, process, technology, and the contracts that are in place between themselves and their payment service provider. That's done independently, and if you need more advice on that, please reach out and I'll put you in direct contact with Compliance 3 uh, and some of the guys within John's team. OK, great. Thanks, Wayne. Um, OK, yeah, so we have run out of time. We've actually run over by six minutes. Um, appreciate everybody who stayed on the session a little bit longer than we said it was going to be. Um, unless there's anything else from you, Wayne, we'll wrap up. Um, so from me, certainly, thank you very much. I've hopefully managed to get back to the, uh, the relevant people with questions and stuff as we've gone along. Um, if you want to contact either myself or Wayne, I'm james.pickering at capta.com. He's wayne.campbell at capta.com. Uh, you can get in touch with us through email or alternatively, we'll hang around for maybe another five or ten minutes in the uh, after this session here with any more questions that you might have. If you want to know any of the future sessions we're going to run, I know a couple of people have asked when the next PCI session we're going to run is. Um, if you go back to the person that sent you the details of this session, so your Pay360 contact, um, maybe you've seen it on LinkedIn or they've contacted you directly. They have a list of all the uh, events that we're going to run through the next probably month, I think it is, that we're running them for. As always, your feedback is much appreciated. Anything you think we could do better, anything uh, you thought was particularly interesting, topics for the future, all that sort of stuff really helps us tailor and steer these sessions uh, in the right direction for you. So from me, thank you very much uh, and we'll see you again soon.